Welcome back to Movies TV Mad and Saturday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad and Instagram at Movies TV Mad triple five. For Instagram, don't get offended. Anyway, welcome to Saturday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. First of all, I want to talk about the rise and rise of Henry Cavill. Let's take ourselves back to 2017 when we all saw the clusterfuck titled uh, Justice League, or Justice League, uh, rewritten and directed by Joss Whedon. The biggest victims of that movie are Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck was the most famous person in that movie. They destroyed him. Remember the smile when Superman turns up? Yeah. So, Henry Cavill, well, they destroyed that man's image in that film. Now, Henry Cavill did great in what he had to do. But, because he did Mission Impossible Fallout and he had facial hair, they called him back for reshoots. That was no fault of Henry Cavill. He came back. He did what they asked him to do. And he even admitted publicly they would have to CG out his facial hair. When we saw the film, they hacked his upper lip. It was some of the worst CG I'd seen because it was all done in a rush. Because Warner Brothers decided that Joss Whedon's Justice League should be released at the same time that Zack Snyder's Justice League was going to be released. You cannot perfect VFX in that short a time. You can't rewrite and reshoot a movie in that short a time. The schedule was disgusting. Why do you think Joss was like a bear uh, with a sore head on the set? You can hardly blame the bloke, can you? So it was a very, very difficult shoot. But Henry Cavill was the biggest victim. And from that moment on, people who supported uh, releasing the Snyder Cut kept on posting Henry Cavill and that upper lip. It was so bad for Henry, really bad. I thought this was the end of Henry as Superman. Let's not forget, we haven't seen him since. He hasn't played Superman since. Zack Snyder's Justice League was shot pre-2017, so that doesn't count. So I thought to myself, he's done. But not only done as Superman, but done in his career. Because what they did to him was despicable. Anyway, several months later, I think he did a shaving ad or something, making fun of the moustache, saying... The moustache is gone now, smiling, laughing at one of the biggest liberties taken on an actor from a studio in the history of the art form, of the entertainment industry. Henry Cavill, any normal person, would have been devastated, heartbroken and probably behind the scenes he was. What did Henry Cavill do about this? Was he moaning on social media? No. He went back to his representatives and they found a way to build up his career. Let's not forget, he and the director of Mission Impossible Fallout got working on a Superman script, which they took to WB. Now, that was rejected, that pitch was rejected, but Henry Cavill was still fighting for Superman because Henry Cavill isn't like Ray Fisher. Ray Fisher is a politician. Henry Cavill loves entertainment. He loves gaming. He loves superheroes. He, he's so proud of the fact that he plays Gerard of Rivera, or however you pronounce the name, in The Witcher. This is a wet dream for Cavill. He loves it because he's like us. He's a nerd. Do you remember when they asked him about toxic fandom and he replied, no, I believe fans have got every right to speak about things, how they speak about them. And that was great. Henry Cavill is a gentleman, he's a talent, and his career is going from strength to strength. He dealt with the toxicity he experienced on Justice League and rebuilt his career. That's how you do it. So, he's Gerard in The Witcher. He's Sherlock Holmes um, in that Netflix series, which is getting a second season, by the way, so he will return. He's now going to be in a spy thriller um, by the director who gave us the first X-Men First Class movie. That's a guy who has got some very strong opinions on how Superman should be made and has said himself he would really, really like to make a Superman film like the Donner Superman film. Now, interesting that those two will be working together, so who knows what could happen 
in the future. Fingers crossed there. So now, since Justice League, we look at Henry Cavill's career and we look at Ray Fisher's career. Ray Fisher is a talented young actor, but he doesn't care about acting. He doesn't care about Cyborg. He doesn't care about you and he doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about any of this. He's just a politician who wants to accuse every white man of being racist. Meanwhile, Henry Cavill, a gentle, soft, kind, compassionate soul, who's also very talented, his career goes from strength to strength and potentially could be the next James Bond. So I'm so proud that this guy played Superman in three awesome Superman movies. Yes, BVS is also a Superman movie. It's not a Batman movie. It's a Batman and a Superman movie. And you can shove your hot takes and shove them where the sun don't shine. So I'm so proud of Henry Cavill because the Superman he played with um, Zack Snyder directing him was sensational. He can be proud of those three movies. So as well as potentially being Bond and getting all these movie roles, every time another, a yet another Henry Cavill kind of role is announced, we get the same reports. Henry Cavill is out as Superman. And I've told you before, until Henry Cavill tells you and me he's not Superman anymore, he's still Superman. Because it doesn't matter if he's got to do a hundred movies a year. At the moment, Henry Cavill can still cameo as Superman. And I absolutely believe that he will cameo in, in Shazam! Fury of the Gods, Black Adam and the Flash movie and potentially Wonder Woman 3. I think Wonder Woman 3 is a huge crossover movie. Uh, so I'm so proud of Henry Cavill and I'd love your thoughts about him because he keeps on getting opportunity after opportunity. But before we leave Henry Cavill, and I never like to leave Henry Cavill because I miss talking about him. I love Henry. I adore Henry. Let's talk about Grace Randolph calling him a diva. Who's Grace Randolph heavily connected with? Wasn't it interesting that he was called a diva? Do you remember what he said during the promotion and the marketing of Justice League? That even if there wasn't a Marvel Cinematic Universe, an MCU, um, even if there wasn't a Marvel, the DCEU still would have struggled like it did. Was he wrong though? Was he wrong? As much as you and I love Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman and Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut, he was talking about struggling with the critics, struggling with the mainstream broader audience. And he was right. Those films wasn't struggling because of the MCU. They were struggling because they were made by someone who was making films for himself and kind of a small audience that love what he does, not for the broader audience. Those three films should have been elsewhere from the beginning. And somebody else should have been dealing with the central universe then everybody would have been happy, like we're going to get now. Now, I don't know what the future holds for the Snyderverse, but I'm not losing hope. So what Henry Cavill said was right, but all of a sudden after that, he was called a traitor to Zack Snyder, and Grace Randolph decided he wasn't a good actor. Not that she's ever rated Henry as Superman, but what does she know? A Z-list failed actress. So, isn't it interesting that she calls him a diva? Let me ask you this, Ms. Ms. Randolph. Is it Ms.? Let's call you Ms. Randolph. Let me ask you this. If he's so difficult to work with, why does he keep on getting role after role? The Witcher, Highlander, a new spy thriller, potentially James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, offer opportunity after opportunity if he's such a diva. The truth is, Ms. Randolph, you are a fucking liar. Look at this, everyone. It's another fantastic poster for James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. And now we've heard that The Suicide Squad in America will be released a day early on the 5th of August. And that is James Gunn's birthday. I've also promised James one of my famous birthday raps. And he actually liked that tweet. Don't worry, James. It's going to be fun. I'm always topless when I do those um, raps. You're going to love it, my friend. So this is a great poster. This is the Suicide Squad team standing on Agent uh, Waller, Amanda Waller's face. It's very interesting. What could this mean? I think it means something. There's some kind of subtext to this, but I don't know. But there is actually a black and white version of this trailer too. Look at this, even better. 
This is such a cool poster. Now, obviously, I like to show you things that are coming, you know, that's going on. I like to update you with the DCEU. But there's another reason why I'm showing you these posters. Now, how many posters have we discussed? How many trailers have we discussed? There was a TV spot the other day. But, unfortunately, as much as I adore some of these Snyderverse fans, and I love following them and them following me and me interacting with them, there's still some that make up the biggest fucking lies you hear. So one of the lies we hear is, well, well, it's only James Gunn and a Harley Quinn account promoting the Suicide Squad. WB, you suck. I've just showed you two posters there, a black and white one and a colour one. We have seen poster among poster. We've had interviews from the actors talking about the movie. We've had one of the producers talking about the fucking movie. This is all coming from the studio. Of course the director's going to promote his own fucking movie. Of course. This is a big movie for him. This is his life's work. You know, it isn't, you know, yeah, Guardians made him um, what he is today. And, you know, basically the broader audience knowing about him. But he read these fucking comics as a kid. This was a very, very big thing. He loves the Os John Ostrander comics. It's a bit like Zack Snyder, which I believe this kind of Rebel Moon thing is going to be his life's work. So it's going to be very important to him. And very important we support that. As you know, I'm a fan of Snyder's movies, especially his DC movies. So this is his life's work. So if this film fails, it's on him. And it will fuck him over. And it will fuck his career over. Now, I like James Gunn. Now, when he first was successful with Guardians, I thought he was really arrogant. But a really strange thing happened with James. Um, when he was fired. When he came back, he seemed a lot more nicer, friendlier, more humble. He didn't speak about politics as much. And I started to think, I actually like this guy. And he comes across as a, a, a much better human being. He was always a great director back in the Scooby-Doo days. He's always been able to entertain the audience, but he's really talking to the fans and critics. Um, so the marketing for the Suicide Squad is great. There's not an issue, again, False propaganda doesn't destroy Warner Brothers. And I feel sorry for you people who think your lies and propaganda, including what Ray Fish is saying, is doing anything to hurt the studio. It's always great to see people like Steve Weintraub sat down by a director like James Gunn. Now, I'm sure James wasn't being toxic. He was just responding to what Steve said. Steve is a really good journalist. I like Steve. But this was such a bad take. If I was someone that made movies or TV, I'd definitely not be on Twitter or other, so or other social platforms because no matter what you do, no matter the choices you make, someone will also be screaming how you did it wrong. Yes, they're the paying customer. They have every right to do that, even if we don't agree with them. But this is what James Gunn had to say. Creator or not, we all encounter the negative opinions of others. If I let others' judgment stop me, I would have stopped telling stories when I was five. Additionally, the majority of people on Twitter are nice. I love this. He goes on. Negative comments can hurt. Positive comments feel good. Both those things are okay. The trick is not to let the opinions of others, positive or negative, define how I feel about myself. Realising I was over-reliant on the positive esteem of others was an awakening that changed my life for the better. It freed me to make true connections with other people, something I found difficult for most of my life. Wow, what a great guy this is. I've got, I've got a lot of time for him. Praise is great, but it's not the same as love, and it's certainly not something to waste a life chasing after. Now, this is very, very interesting because... We talk about these people always chasing after famous people and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, and, and they love it. I, I forgot the word for it, but everyone's trying to do that. And James is saying, listen, this is, this is what the real world consists of. Some people are negative, some people are positive towards you. And it's, it's like I always say uh, to some of my friends in the industry, I say, you are never as good as they say you are, and you're never as bad as they say you are. And I always say that to my friends inside the industry, when people, you know, when one of them's had a bad day and the press have been after them, and, you know, and they, they're a bit upset, I say, listen, I know it's difficult, but they, they're never, you're never as good as they say you are, and you're never as bad. At the end of the day, you're here, you're on the inside, and they're on the outside, 
Don't worry about what they say. They have a right to say it, as I've already said. But at the end of the day, if we take everything people say to heart, it's the problem. So well done, James Gunn, for speaking some truths there. Black Widow director confirms Marvel discussed including big MCU cameo. Black Widow director Kate Shortland confirms Marvel discussed including major MCU cameos in Scarlett Johansson's long-awaited solo movie, although it's not really her solo movie, is it? By Cooper Hood of Screen Rant. Marvel Studios considered including major cameos in Black Widow or other Marvel Cinematic Universe heroes like Iron Man, Scarlett Johansson's solo Black Widow movies finally out in theatres and on Disney Plus after multiple delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. MCU fans around the world can now see the movie and experience a new chapter in Natasha Romanoff's story set during Captain America Civil War. The 24th movie... The 24th MCU movie might be set in the past, but it is connected to the main MCU story and sets up the future in major ways. One part of Black Widow that might leave you as surprised is the lack of any major MCU heroes appearing. This became common practice for Marvel Studios in Phase 3, with Hulk in 4, Rangrock, Nick Fury in Spider-Man Far From Home, and Captain Marvel, and most of the Avengers in Civil War. Rumours swirled during Black Widow's development that it would at least include a cameo from Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. However, as viewers of the movie can attest, Tony Stark is not in Black Widow and neither is any other established MCU hero because Robert Downey Jr. is now working with DC on Sweet Tooth. He's not interested in Marvel. He's basically walked away from all the actors. He's unfollowed them. He's not interested. And by the way, these cameos and crossovers started pretty much after the first Avengers movie, for your information. The absence of Iron Man or another fa uh, familiar Avenger was at one point on the table for Black Widow. Though director Kate Shortland spoke to Games Radar about the movie and the outlet asked her about those rumours of a Robert Downey Jr. Camo cameo. She confirmed that she, Marvel Studios and the film's creative team discussed many different characters appearing. That idea though was then questioned by Kevin Fake, who suggested Black Widow doesn't need any other Avengers. Read what uh, Shortland said below. You are going to fucking love this. Well, you're not, but listen. Initially, there was discussions about everything, about all of the different characters. What we decided was, and I think Kevin was really great, he said she doesn't need the boys. <laughs> she doesn't need the boys. <laughs> It's so fucking funny, everyone. These people really don't want people to watch their movies or to like them. It's men versus boys. It's men versus boys versus girls now. This is how fucking childish we've become now. Right. Oh, that's funny. You must admit that's fucking funny, just not in a good way. We didn't want it to feel like she needs support. We want her to stand alone, and she does. Stand alone! She goes back to find her family. She stands with her family. She's not on her fucking own, is she? When the rumours of Iron Man having cameo in Black Widow originally surfaced, fans expected that this would happen with a cut-off familiar footage from Captain America Civil War, so Danny wouldn't have to film anything. He wouldn't have done it anyway. He's done with them. Uh, new after Avengers Endgame, this could have made sense given Black Widow's placement in the MCU timeline. The movie also could have featured organic cameos by Captain America at the very end or even Hawkeye during the Budapest mission. Yeah, you'd think with um, Hawkeye's connection to uh, Natasha Romanoff, that would have been the best one. But she doesn't need the boys, even if the boy is one of the closest people in her fucking life. Mission. Flashbacks. Young version of Nick Fury and Phil Coulson even could have appeared at the very beginning. Jeremy Renner's voice is heard briefly during flashbacks, but Thunderbolt Ross is the only supporting cast member who has been in the MCU before, other than Valentina's appearance in Black Widow's post-credits. As fun as it could have been, here we go, to see some other familiar faces in Black Widow, the reasoning to keep them out makes perfect sense. Black Widow fans waited over a decade to see this movie and one where Natasha Romanoff is in the spotlight. She's not in the fucking spotlight. Other MCU characters could have worked in Black Widow, even driven more interest in the movie if they were marketed, but they undoubtedly would have been distractions too. Instead, Marvel Studios kept the focus on Natasha's story. No, they didn't. In what is expected to be Scarlett Johansson's final MCU appearance, she doesn't need the boys. Wow, 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 wow. She doesn't need the boys. 
We are now so perfect, the extreme left who have poisoned, poisoned the entertainment industry and now saying she doesn't need the boys. It's boys versus girls. Do you remember the battle of the sexes when we were young guys from our generation? This is what we come to now. This childish, juvenile fucking hatred for one gender is fucking hilarious. She doesn't need the boys. She needed the girls though. And she needed her daddy, didn't she? Who's a boy? Who's a man? Anyway, there you go. Black Widow, Natasha Romanoff, doesn't need the boys. Well, 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 well. Chris Evans wouldn't have done it, and Robert Downey Jr. wouldn't have done it. Anyway, because they're, they're done. They're not interested. Anyway, we move on. When I first heard Margot Robbie was doing um, a Barbie movie, I knew what was going on here. Of course, this is the extreme left again, gunning for men, gunning for their feminist agenda. Of course, this is why this nut job is doing a Barbie, Barbie movie. But they got Greta Garwick now, a very talented director, to try and masquerade what they're attempting to do. Now, before we start, let's talk about Ken before I read this article. We both know Ken won't be involved because Barbie doesn't need Ken. That's where we're going to go. Just you wait and see anyway. Greta Garwick confirmed to direct live-action Barbie movie. Greta Garwick signs on as the director for upcoming live-action Barbie movie. The film stars Margot Robbie with shooting set to start in 2022 uh, by Kat Noland of Screen Rant. Greta Garwick has signed on to direct the upcoming live-action Barbie movie. It was confirmed in 2019 that Gerwig would co-write the Barbie script with her partner Noah Boomla. Uh, Boomla whom she is frequently, wo frequently works with. While there was speculation about Gerwig directing the feature when she initially came on board, nothing was finalised at the time. Over the last five years, the Oscar-nominated filmmaker has carved a name for herself as one of Hollywood's most talented writers and directors with critically acclaimed works including Lady Bird and Little Women. Go anyway, yeah, basically the original Little Women's great. That one's not so great. Anyway. Over the last five years, the Oscar-nominated filmmaker has carved a name for herself as one of Hollywood's most talented writers and directors. Uh, where are we? Yeah, so Gerwig's notoriety as a wearer of many hats goes back further than her mainstream success. However, indie film fans have been rooting for Gerwig as far back as the early 2000s with her earlier works, including Frances Ha and Mistress America, among several other under-the-radar favourites. Plans for the Barbie movie started in 2009, with rumours circulating that Amy Schumer would be the lead around the same time. It was also believed that Mindy Kaling and Anne Hathaway were potential candidates. In 2019, Warner Brothers and Mattel confirmed Margot Robbie for Barbie's title role. Robbie was confirmed as a producer of the film as well, which definitely means the extremist feminist kind of commentary is in this film, working with her production company, Lucky Chap. And even the lucky chap, chap thing is very toxic. Entertainment. Barbie is one of 13 other toy brands under the Mattel name with a live action treatment plan. Some others on this list include American Girl, Barney and Hot Wheels. Now, in addition to co-writing, Variety reported that Gerwig will direct Barbie as well. Production for the film hasn't started yet and Boom, uh, and Boom Back and Gerwig are still finishing up their current feature. White Noise, which Gerwig was starring alongside Adam Driver. Boomback's latest directorial success was Netflix Marriage Story, which also starred Driver. Starting in early 2022, filming for the Barbie movie will take place in London at Warner Brothers Leavesden Studios. The theatrical release is projected for 2023. While details regarding the movie's plot are still under wraps, uh, Robbie previously expressed to Variety her enthusiasm about, uh, enthusiasm about the film's positive approach to connecting with younger kids and his ability to serve an, as an aspiration. This is going to be fucking hilarious. In other words, you want to indoctrinate young kids into thinking what you think and your crazy views. We know what's going on here, Margo. That being said, Robbie admitted that playing Barbie comes with a lot of baggage. Here we go, here we go. She explained that while it's important to recognise the nostalgic properties, it's also an opportunity to find creative ways to attack them. Oh yes, this is what Margot really wants to do. I told you, they're extremists and they will do anything to put their toxic agenda in the project. I don't care if you like Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. This woman is a toxic extremist. It's as simple as that. 
and she's a problem. The more movies she gets, the more we're going to get. Now, I expect this film to flop heavily and for people to hate it, but she's just admitted it herself. Presumably, this attack may have something to do with Gen X and Millennials' growing awareness of building positive self-esteem for younger girls and attempt to demolish unrealistic self-image expectations. That's not what she's up to. Robbie made her faith in Gerwig's approach clear, saying once people hear Gerwig is the writer and director, the expectation for the film will immediately shift. Uh, listen, I don't know why Gerwig's doing this film. Clearly, she's an extremist as well, but this is going to end in fucking tears, and I can't wait for the explosion. Taking on such an iconic staple comes with inherently high stakes. Gerwig's adaption of Little Women was no small undertaking and neither is Barbie. More and more recently, audiences' exposure to mainstream content is met with less conventional approaches, arguably broadening viewer horizons when it comes to what qualifies as good entertainment. Gerwig's roots stem back to sub subgenia of independent film known as Mumblecore, characterised by favouring dialogue, dialogue over plot and putting emphasis on relationships, because that's never been done before, has it? While this style is more often seen in low-budget films, Gerwig and other filmmakers from the indie world still let it show in their high-budget successes. Adult audiences who are equipped with critical thinking skills have come to appreciate less watered-down material and more existentially driven themes. As for kid viewers, Gerwig's take on Barbie may have the potential to achieve the same success by reaching younger audiences beneath the surface. This is going to be fucking hilarious. It really is. Right, let's talk about Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig is where she is today, uh, basically on IP. No, let me say that again. Greta Gerwig is not some once upon a time unknown indie director who just made it, who just won the lottery. You're already successful. You're already talented. You could be in the main part of Hollywood now. No. She has been appointed by DNA. And it's as simple as that. That's where she is now. Because if you haven't got their DNA, you're still making unknown indie movies. But by the way, those indie movies are far superior than today's modern cinema. Let's be absolutely clear about this. So Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie are going to teach us all how Barbie should be portrayed. And I can't wait for them to lose millions, hundreds of millions on this project. Because that's where we're going. Now finally today we're going to talk about James Bond. James Bond producers say series, series is at critical juncture after Craig. Oh, it's at a serious juncture already. Just wait. You see that... They're, they're moving it afterwards so they can, you know, whatever we do next is very important. I, I have seen No Time to Die. Yes, I've seen No Time to Die. So they're in fucking trouble already. But they were in trouble after Craig's second movie and then his last movie. Craig saying exactly this. I would rather slash my wrist than do another Bond film. They obviously bribed him, you know, stroked his ego and he came back for one more time. They think that Craig is the bee's fucking knees, but Craig's made a lot of bad decisions. He has been too involved with the, with the big decisions over there. And this is the problem with Bond right now. And there's too much of Bond YouTube not addressing this situation. So as I say, I have seen No Time to Die. So I know the damage is already pre after Daniel Craig. But let's give this a read. James Bond producer says series is at a critical juncture after Craig. The long-time producers of James Bond say franchise is at a critical juncture following Daniel Craig's departure and Amazon's acquisition of MGM by Adam Benz of Screen Rant. The long-time producers of the James Bond franchise say the series is at a critical juncture following Daniel Craig's departure from the mind of Ian Fleming's 007 was birthed into the literary world in 1953 with novel Casino Royale. As the author went on to write a total of 12 Bond novels and short stories with plenty of source material to work with, the film franchise based around the British secret agent began with 1962's Doctor No, with Sean Connery taking on the titular role. Throughout the decades, the highly coveted role was passed around between a few other actors before landing on Daniel Craig for 2006 Casino Royale, who reprised the role for 2008's Quantum of Solace, problematic, 2012's Skyfall, and 2015's Spectre, utterly problematic. Craig's final portrayal of Bond will be the long-delayed No Time to Die, the film I said I've already watched, which is set for a release date this fall, as the franchise prepares again, gain a new face, there has been much debate about the direction the series should take. 
such as whether it should continue Craig's self-serious take on Bond or return to the goofy action of the franchise's glory days. Amazon's recent acquisition of MGM, which gives them control of the 007 brand, also threw the franchise into a minor tizzy. Now, the franchise's longtime producers, Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson, say it, it, it is at a critical juncture. As Craig prepares to take his final bow as the role will soon be up for grabs, the producing duo say that finding, <coughs> finding the perfect replacement will be essential to the future success of the franchise. According to Radio Times, while the two don't speak publicly very often, they did recently release a statement addressing the statement of MGM following its acquisition by Amazon. Read their statement below. MGM bosses Mike and Pam understand that we are at a critical juncture and that the continuing success of James Bond series is dependent on us getting the next iteration right. Well, you haven't got this iteration right, never mind the future one, and, we, and will give us the support we need to do this. As I say, this is utterly interesting, especially what, what they did in No Time to Die. Since Amazon's acquisition of the legendary Hollywood studio MGM in May, there has been plenty of concern regarding the theatrical future of Bond. However, Broccoli and Wilson did offer some consolation in this, their statement. They said that Amazon has assured them the 007 franchise will continue to see uh, theatrical releases in the future rather than being released exclusively on their streaming service Amazon Prime. Now, that doesn't mean it won't be on the streaming service and movie theatres as well, by the way. It's always good to break up what these people are saying. With Craig announcing his departure, the biggest question that remains is who will take the next turn as the super suave secret agent. Idris Elba is a popular name that has been floated for years, who would also make history as the first black actor to portray the role. Tom Hardy also has been a fan favourite, and Britain's Raging Page has recently gained... Uh, some momentum as well. The franchise is absolutely at a critical juncture as this casting will be the first major decision in the Amazon era of James Bond. So let's go to No Time to Die first and discuss that. No Time to Die had Danny Boyle, right? And then they got rid of Boyle because Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson decided to go totally extreme left SJW. Now, of course, Danny Boyle wouldn't want to go down this direction. So they sacked him and they brought in a brand new director. So the director, whose name I can't pronounce, really good director. But then all of a sudden we heard that um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge was rewriting the movie or putting some gags in. That's when we all knew we had to worry, when an extreme leftist feminist was coming in to teach the men how it's done. She decided to bring... Um, an, an actress of colouring, which is, which is which there is absolutely no problem of, but she decided to give her the 007 number. From that moment on, I think the red flags were out and it was problematic. Now, I was given the opportunity to see this movie. How and why, I'm not going to say, but I have seen this movie. Whether you believe that or not, I, I couldn't give a shit. Now, I saw this movie. The action is obviously fantastic. Craig is fantastic, but this film is absolutely a fucking disgrace on what Ian Fleming created and what Barbara Broccoli, Barbara Broccoli's late father created in the movie universe. That's what it is. This film is going to have a huge problem. Initially, I think people will come in to watch it, but there's going to be a lot of toxic um, conversations about this movie. Right, so how is this movie going to end then? Is this woman still going to have 007's number? How is this going to work after this movie? Are they killing off James Bond in this movie? I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that the extreme left have finally got their hands on James Bond's balls. And they're squeezing them hard. Now, if Amazon didn't come in, this would have continued in their next iteration. But now Amazon are there. And all Amazon care about is Wonga. And they're not going to allow them to fucking do that. Neither would Netflix if they owned it. It was a bit of a battle. Netflix wanted it too. I always knew that MGM and Bond was going to a streamer. And I said it on my, on my Twitter account, at Movies TV Mag. You can give me a follow over there. And I've always said it on my channel. And people who always watch my content can back me up on that. So um, Amazon are not going to allow this SJW extremist bullshit to continue. Because they know there's no fucking money in it. So James Bond is at a pivotal stage and Amazon 
and Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson are going to be at loggerheads because Broccoli has decided that she wants to go extreme left, but this is not a way a company, an intelligence saying company, that wants to make lots of money off something they like sunk trillions of dollars in, right? So they're not going to allow it. So they're going to be at loggers head. Ultimately, Broccoli isn't going to survive if she fights them or is Wilson. They can talk about that they have rights as well to this film franchise, but the truth is MGM and Bond has been swallowed whole and they have to get with the program. You have to start making great, consistent Bond again. You need to cast a great male actor, and I don't care if he's black or white, and this SJW extremist bullshit has to stop. Take your hands off of James Bond's balls because nobody asked you to squeeze them. That's it for today's Saturday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. Please feel free to comment down below. Agree, disagree, couldn't give a shit. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Tap that little notification bell so you never miss anything. At Movies TV Mad on Twitter. At Movies TV Mad Triple Five on my Instagram. And I will see you in the next video. Until then, see you later.